we are thrilled to have Jen Rattay here with us today. Um, I actually met Jen in her job just previous to the Hewlett Foundation, which was working in the public management program at the Graduate School of Business, which some of you might know one of our partners, Gina Jorash, um, is very involved with today. But Jen was very involved for many years. Were you there, five years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so five years at the GSB, um, doing all sorts of great work programming with students and working with uh, SSIR and all of the different arms of the Center for Social Innovation at Stanford. Um, Jen has also worked for the Pew Charitable Trusts, the National Wildlife Foundation, the World Watch Institute, and the UN Conference on Trade and Development. So she has quite a background um, and that she brings into the Organizational Effectiveness Department at Hewlett. And what's so um, particularly great about um, having her here to talk with us today is that the Organizational Effectiveness Department is really focused on grant making and capacity building for grantees. Um, so Jen is going to take some time to share uh, that work with us and Hewlett's perspectives, and then we'll have lots of time for questions. So um, I hope everybody has has brought several with them. Um, and with that, Jen, just thank you so much for taking the time and being here. Sure, it's my pleasure. Thanks, Lindsay. It's nice to meet you all. Um, but as Lindsay said, I'm, I'm actually would like to make this more of a discussion. So I'll I'll start out with a few framing remarks, and, um, share what I think is kind of the the gem of what I can ha offer, which is just what have we learned in terms of our work with um, capacity building, kind of learn the hard way sometimes, um, but really want to also hear about your experiences since I, if I understand correctly, um, a lot of the um, impetus of sv 2 grants are to help support organizations to build them, to scale them, to build their capacity. So I imagine there's there's some expertise in the room that we can have a conversation. Um, I've also been a fan of sv 2 for, for a long time, so it's really, it's a pleasure to be here because of that. Um, just in terms of understanding where everyone is, um, it was great to hear where everyone worked and what they were interested in content-wise, um, but how, in terms of, why don't we just do a quick show of hands, um, in terms of your experience with capacity building as, um, through philanthropy, you know, how many of you would describe yourself as pretty expert in that? It's something you, perhaps you were an executive, no, I'm kidding, shaking heads. <laughs> Is there such a thing? <laughs> That's right. That's supposed to scare yeah. Or um, perhaps a consultant to nonprofits um, working to help them build their capacity in different areas. Okay. Um, you know, have, and I know Jason. Jason's been involved for some time now. Okay. Great. And Gina put you in that category too with your work. Um, and then if, so a few of you haven't had much ex okay so we've got a, a few with no experience <laughs> on the other side on the other side <laughs> that's great well so um that i think that'll be helpful so i encourage you to kind of to jump in um disagree with me too i'm going to be throwing out some things that we've learned over the few years at the hewlett foundation through the capacity building grant making that doesn't mean that they are right they just happen to be our our experience and so I want to check those with you all um you know, so certainly Constructive criticism and disagreements can help improve our, our knowledge base too. If you've had different experiences, um, what I'll do is I'll I'll first provide a very quick overview of the Hewlett Foundation, um, or maybe make Jane do it. <laughs> <laughs> She's chewing. I'll do it. Um, to narrow down um, to um, just provide quick content on our what we call our organizational effectiveness grants program, in which we provide about sixty capacity building grants to our current grantees each year. Um, and then what I'll do is share, the, share some lessons learned, uh, and then I'll, I'll finish. If we have time, I'm, I want to be sensitive to everyone's time, um, I'd love to throw out and, and get your feedback on how, do you, how would you think about evaluating capacity building grants? Mm -hmm. I was curious to hear, your, it sounds like you're thinking about how do you evaluate certain grants that you're making in terms of some short-term indicators of progress. It's something that we think a lot about at the Hewlett Foundation, and it's particularly challenging in the area of capacity building in terms of how do we know that this work that we believe is important, um, but that it really is helping our, our grantees, our investees making, um, make progress toward their mission. So I'd love to get your ideas on that front. And then I'll just finish with some trends that we've been seeing and a few resources that you may um, may know about or may not um, if you want to continue some, some work in this um, area. Okay. Uh, in terms of Hewlett, um, we are um, not too far away from here. It's a 15 minute drive. We're over on Sand Hill Road, <coughs> corner of Stanford campus. Um, we have been uh, making grants. Uh, the foundation was established in, before I was there, in 1966. And the first grant was made in 67. I know, it's shocking. Um, and uh, Bill Hewlett, uh, who was one of the two founders of Hewlett Packard, which is on Page Mill Road, not too far away from here, um, he has his. Um, 
one of his favorite sayings was, um, never, never stifle a generous impulse. And he, you know, as I understood, that's how he led at HP, but then certainly in his, his with his personal wealth, um, established with his wife and his oldest son, Walter Hewlett, the Hewlett Foundation. When um, Bill Hewlett um, passed on in 2001, he, he left a lot of money, um, billions, to the foundation, and that's um, how we became a $7 billion foundation, one of the, the nation's lar largest. Um, in, in terms of um, our different grant-making areas, we have seven very different ones. Um, we do a lot of work internationally. It sounds like a lot of you are um, very interested in international giving. Um, I would say about half of our grant-making is international. Someone will correct me if I'm getting that a little off. Um, but then all the way to national education policy, um, trying to mitigate the effects of climate change, uh, to helping our, our local schools here, um, local performing arts groups as well, uh, reproductive health um, and, and women's education rights. So we're really a, a conglomerate of a, a bunch of different interest areas. Um, and uh, the type of grant making we do is, is one that I would, I would call, uh, try to be as strategic as possible. And, and what that really means is in all of our program areas, um, we try to do a lot of research on what's, what's already been done. You know, so for instance, in climate change, you know, what, what approaches to climate change have, have worked or um, not worked and why, and then be very clear about how much money we can throw and invest in this prob um, the problem and clarify our goals, our long-term goals, as well as our steps along the way to show that we would actually be making progress. And we spend a lot of time thinking about evaluation. It's kind of the type of grant making we do. Um, in terms of grant size, our, our average grant size is $350,000. Um, and we, um, compared to our large peer foundations, make a lot um, more uh, general operating support grants than is usual. Um, and th those are typically multi-year. And we can talk about why that is. Um, and now, the, the piece that I oversee of this is a, um, a, a relatively small organizational effectiveness grants program. It's about $2.5 million a year where um, we're able to provide about 60 capacity building grants to our current grantees. So we, we have about 800 grantees each year and then a smaller subset of those get supplemental dollars. That, so these are basically one-year project grants where they um, the current model that we have, but I recognize there are a number of different capacity building models out there, but our, our current model is to provide an average of $30,000 in a grant and on top of the parent grant, which is sometimes general operating support, um, to our, directly to our grantees, and that helps them hire some outside expertise that they don't have right now on staff, um, say for strategic planning, before fundraising planning, communications, building their evaluation systems, um, board development. Do you make that decision for them, or do they come to you and say we need this? Great question. So we, we typically, um, so we'll, we'll let our grantees know that we have this capacity building grants program, and but really leave it to them to come to us mm -hmm. to self-identify you know, what they'd like to work on and when they'd like right. to work on. And we found that that's like a key indicator of success, too, is kind of the readiness factor to engage in this work, since it does take some resources and some time. Um, that said, we have had some some opportunities to kind of suggest gently to our grantees that you know instead of a a fundraising plan, perhaps you um, we could um, work on some strategic planning so to strengthen the clarity of the goals and the vision, and then maybe sequence in some fundraising planning. So while we don't always say yes to what the grantees necessarily asking for at that point, um, we we it it starts with a dialogue about what is needed when. Okay. Are you one of the few that organizations that does that? I, I have to mm -hmm. say it's, it sounds um, very like a duh, but mm -hmm. but I don't think a lot of organizations do that. A lot of philanthropists do that. So you know, I, I'm not familiar with some of the smaller foundations yeah. in terms of, um, but in terms of the larger set, they, um, I have heard a number of over 250 of the largest funders actually have capacity building grants programs. And are they always um, called so organizational effectiveness? Not always. Oh, okay. So they could be technical assistance oh, programs, right, right. management assistance programs, right. um, yeah, sometimes capacity building programs. Our program is um, six years old now, and it's actually the, um, it's, it's modeled, although we've shifted it over the last few years, the model as we've learned, um, but really was modeled after the Packard Foundation's 25-year-plus uh, organizational effectiveness program. And they were 
really pioneers. Um, and I, I think a lot of what you see in the sector in terms of capacity building um, came out of the Packard experience. So they were doing this work before anyone else was. And they've also contributed tremendously to the literature on what makes good capacity building grants, what to think about. Um, they actually used to have a staff of 12 just in their capacity building grants program. That's with the change in assets, that's um, a chunk of sum. Yeah, that's a good question. But I think as we see a shift in the sector, and I think maybe you've had some conversations about some of the trends in philanthropy and maybe with Regina, but one of the ones that we've seen that I think goes along with this um, interest in value and capacity building is, is also the move to more core support, the flexible core support for grantees. Whereas, um, and it, it is tricky one that we are debating within the foundation and trying to, um, since assessing the progress of our grants is so important, um, it does get a, a little trickier if you're providing like this not a, um, gen, general operating support grant. Mm -hmm. you know, since you can't attribute your, your grant dollar that went to keep the lights on mm -hmm. to necessarily um, you know, some, some improvement in program that you might be able to track through some indicator. Um, but we do think that it's important for a number of reasons. So I want to now hear from you all. You, you all have experiences in some fantastic um, corporations, and then I'm, certainly I'm sure with different nonprofits, but how would you characterize a healthy nonprofit organization? Now, what does that mean? We talk about organizational effectiveness, but you know, what does that look like and feel like? I'm going to start it with a little bit of cash reserve, like they're not going to go out of business next month. Helpful. <laughs> <laughs> not living on the edge, huh? Uh, maybe they, they don't have a uh, mission creep. They're not jumping after every new grant be, and, and it's not aligned with, that's not aligned with their mission, but they're able to take advantage of because they're not searching for dollars underneath chairs and change and pockets and stuff that they can take advantage of uh, new opportunities that come in the door. Mm -hmm. Exactly, being flexible yeah. and adaptive. And actually even able to say no to yeah. some funding streams, yes. which is hard to do yes. and pretty unique. Mm -hmm. But I would say that would be an effective organization. Yeah. What else? Appropriate power balance between EE and wood. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Um, especially in smaller organizations, mm -hmm. in my experience, um, in terms of sort of the typical founderitis situation <coughs> and how you can transition away from that as organizations grow. Mm -hmm. So then another piece of that could be um, succession planning mm -hmm. in terms of if you have a leader who's been really integral to the founding of the organization and maybe moving on for, you know, the organization is scaling up and now needs a different skill set. How do you manage that transition? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I always think of infrastructure. Um, you can see nonprofits always so focused on the programmatic part, but they don't have, whether it's, you know, resource policies or technology or whatever. It's <laughs> Measurement mm -hmm. and results. So say, say a little bit more about that. Just, uh, I mean, something that, that I always, you know, think about is, you know, how can you, what, how can you determine success? Are there mm -hmm. phases in your success planning rather than just being, you know, maybe a little too over optimistic in what you're trying to achieve, but unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. having that balance of optimism and realism. So it sounds like um, goals. You know, clear, yeah. clear goals that are realistic, yeah. but then also and measures measure. of progress. Yes. So commitment also to mm -hmm. that that is really hard to do in the in philanthropy and, uh, and certainly yeah. in a number of organizations. But but taking that step back to look what's what's working and what hasn't worked, as opposed to just the always forward looking on the next next opportunity. And that hap certainly happens with the nonprofit organizations too. Mm -hmm. What else? A lot of other things too. I think a strong leader yep. who can in, you know inspire uh, is incredibly important to the health Absolutely. Of, of an organization. And sometimes it means that you have to bifurcate the role and have one person who is a strong administrator and another mm -hmm. person who's a strong outside person. And I can think of one nonprofit that we worked with that um, initially um, they had two people for it. You know, and one person was the inside ran the organization. Mm -hmm. This is downtown college prep, and Greg Lipman ran mm -hmm. the school, and uh, Jennifer Andalus was the outside person, and you know she could, you know, sell 
ice. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> the, the phrase is, but um, it, it was a very effective way to separate it. And meanwhile, the, both of them got to learn a little bit of the other one's skills. Mm -hmm. So eventually, they've taken on some of each other's roles. Mm -hmm. And Greg is heading another organization, mm -hmm. and, and Jennifer's got a bigger downtown college prep than she used to. But I came from one like that. It worked really well. Yeah, but yeah. It, sometimes a strong <coughs> leader is not willing to share that mm -hmm. power and mm -hmm. really willing to hire the people who fill in the gaps, and that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And to listen. And to listen, yes. What else? Is there anything on the, the board side? We, we had mentioned mm -hmm. a good relationship with the ED as one piece of it. Anything the else? Communication that? between mm -hmm. the ED to the board, mm -hmm. the ED to the staff. The ability to understand where the organization is and then be able to communicate that out. Right. Yeah. No board chairs going to staff and trying to build a relationship. And yeah, just yeah. getting a sense of where the work is or, uh, in yeah. these economic conditions and what they need and what needs to change. Mm -hmm. well, some, some boards, as you all probably are aware, um, can you really get into the details in terms of the emotional management piece of it or just kind of knowing when to step back, you know, kind of the trust the staff and the AD. Um, you know, when to focus on strategy versus when to, to dive really deeply in. Mm -hmm. And actually having um, a strong and diverse board yep, that has exactly. a, diver a diversity of skills that represent the community yeah. that's being served as well as the donor community. Some, you know, some boards you only have people from the donor community or from, you know, political arena and, and nobody that or from Stanford University, or right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and or everybody went to the same school. And it it's helpful to um, not to uh, prevent walking all in the same path. You have to have some people who will, who are willing to step up and play a devil's advocate, and you also have to have people who are willing to take on different roles. Mm -hmm. You know, someone who will champion fund development because that is a board role as well as a staff mm -hmm. role. Which not everybody has, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and financial management and HR policies and all those kinds of things that boards can help out with. I'd say ownership too, and this kind of crosses all strata of organizations. But it seems to me there's always you know hot potato issues that people don't want to deal with. But they, I think a very strong sense of clarity of who's in charge of what and who's responsible for that and who's responsible mm -hmm. for that outcome because it can be it, it, I mean how many of us have been in organizations where the the project creeps around the table because no one has pointed at you and said you know what Jamie you're the you're the owner of this and I can give you help but you ultimately own this mm -hmm. so I've found that to be really damaging and morale um, you know destructive mm -hmm. exactly um, Jason, you mentioned communications, and I think it was more in the context of between the ED and the board. Um, you know, communication for the organization yeah. externally is is so mm -hmm. important in terms of you know for fundraising purposes. Um, but we we actually spend a fair amount of our capacity building dollars on the mo the top um, type of grant typically strategic planning, mm -hmm. and particularly in this economic downturn yeah. when um, a lot of our grantees. They tend to be organizations that already have strategic plans or think um, in terms of what are we trying to accomplish and how will we get there. But because of the realities of this economic downturn, we've had a lot say, you know, we actually need some help reevaluating and doing the contingency planning. And now maybe we need to reassess what some of our metrics are going to be in terms of short term, um, given the realities of resources um, being constrained. And then another, another big piece of it is actually communications in terms of. Um, planning that you know, change the message or different message um, to different audiences that could have a fundraising component or it could just be, you know, if we're if part of the mission of the organization is to change people's minds and behavior and to have a really thoughtful marketing communication plan um, behind that. Um, and so we'll, we'll um, get some expertise to come in and help our grantees out with that. So those are all good. Is there anything else that, that um, was left off the table? Anyone want to throw anything else in? I don't want to steal Lance's thunder, <laughs> but we. Um, but I will. But, but I haven't <laughs> said anything yet. Um, we, I think, increasingly in the last few years, the conversation about what's your revenue model, and how well do you understand it. I mean, in addition to the point that Holly made it to lead us off about cash reserves, um, you know, the organizations that have an understanding of the model, um, 
and occasionally the model is still we get grants. Um, <laughs> usually it now is more than that, mm -hmm. um, but I think that's pretty critical in this era. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and we found Sorry. some organizations. In fact, one that Jason's been working with him. The model they had a great model, and then the rules changed. Right. And mm -hmm. so they're scrambling to develop a new one, and we're trying to help them with that. Mm -hmm. Jason in particular. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to see that they get so stuck in just, okay, we're still just a startup. Well, you're five years old. And you're, yeah. right. Right. you're not a startup anymore. We need to develop your development plan and really expand out of what you're trying to do. And the reliance on, well, we've always been able to meet the budget just doesn't work when right. you start expanding and growing. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it sounds like Lance. Um, it's not about it. I just keep hearing this banging. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know where it's coming from. I think everyone's construction on the floor of that. That is a beautiful building. Um, Lance, you mentioned that you were interested in scaling or had some background in that. And um, that's something that we, you know, capacity building. I, we were talking about um, we both have toddlers at home. Yeah. You know, a healthy organization, just like a, a person, means something in very different life cycles. Yeah. You know, so you were talking about a five year old organization that's going into adolescence. But all of these things that we just talked about look pretty different if it's a start, you know, startup newborn or all the way to a mature organization or some, uh, an organization that's scaling. And so it's very much, it's not, um, you know, there, there aren't the check boxes that we use or I think that any capacity builder can use to say, okay, now we've achieved, you know, it, we are now a, a, a highly successful organization because, uh, you know, that's not going to be relevant six months from now or two years from now as you go into a different life cycle phase. So there's this, I think, really fascinating dynamism to this all as well. And so to kind of, what, how we think about it is, you know, trying to understand where the organization is. You know, if it's a three-person shop, then there's a, you know, executive director who's doing everything from fundraising to strategy to everything. You know, opening the mail. It's <laughs> <laughs> that info email account. <laughs> <laughs> to then developing five years later to now needing to search for new types of leaders or diversify the board. Um, those are those opportunities that we look for our grantees to say, all right, if we give them a quick infusion of cash here to help them get to the next level. Um, and we like to think about our grants as, as really trying to leave something behind to that hopefully the, that grantee organization won't have to hire that same consultant back the next year to do that same work. So that's, and we think about success, that's a part of it for us. Is it kind of a one-time expense and now that knowledge or those skills can reside and can stay in the organization and take it to a new level. Jennifer, could you yeah. talk a little bit about how much support you get beyond the money? There's a couple things sure. you mentioned which were really interesting. So I think, you know, one is, you know, strategic planning is an area you guys fund a lot. Mm -hmm. And so a couple things. One is, do you give them some idea of what is best practice in terms of how to be transparent and how to be inclusive and how to be iterative with staff and with the board so that, you know, there's percolation up and there's buy-in at the end? Um, so I'd like to just hear kind of how you deal with that. And then the second aspect is, do you guys have a Rolodex to recommend people? Because that's the other issue is quality. <laughs> yeah. You're absolutely right. Actually, just I'll I'll start with your second question. It's um, we we have a Rolodex in terms of um, consultants or grantees have chosen to use over the last six years, and then we all have kind of a Rolodex of people we know in the sector. You know, Jason. You know, which, in terms of what he what skills he could bring to the organization. Um, We've actually really struggled with how do we make that more accessible, um, and we struggle with it, it for a few reasons. I mean, a few there's a technological reason there, but um, but what and this came from the Packard Foundation um, many years as they tried different approaches. Is that um, when we think about capacity building, I think part of it is to help our grantees become good consumers of consultants themselves. And the easy kind of the easy answer would be. Well, which consultants do you want us to use and just give us the contact information and fund us and we're off and running? And um, as I understand from Packard's experience of you know decades of this, and then we've we've found this too in our grant making is that um, sometimes that just doesn't make a very healthy consultant to grantee um, relationship, and, and that is so core to the success of the project. In part because we just can't get away from the power dynamics of us being a major funder, sometimes the largest funder of these grant of these organizations that are trying to do organizational development and building and really to do that effectively oftentimes have to air their, their dirty laundry 
And so what we've, we've actually erred on the side of really trying to protect that relationship between the grantee organization and the consultant they choose to hire. But again, within that frame, we will we'll still get the questions of, you know, well, do you have some good strategic planning consultants? And we will give a, you know, we always give more than one, you know, a, a list of consultants. Um, but then what we've, we've started to do over the last year, and actually June and her team have been really helpful on this, is we actually have some really exciting um, systems, our, our grants database systems that are allowing us to really quickly pull a report to say, you know, in the last two years, all the Bayer organizations that have gone through strategic planning, and we can print a list, and essentially we, we provide a grantee who's looking to do that work with you know 10 other grantee executive directors who have just gone through or going through it now a strategic <coughs> planning process who have vetted and found a consultant and so that they can do some kind of peer-to-peer -peer, um, due diligence and we've we've so far had some good results with that um, and that helps a little bit we're uh, one thing I didn't mention about our foundation too is compared to the, the big uh, large Large foundations our size is we're extremely leanly staffed, mm -hmm. and so we've had to make some tough decisions too about where do we, um, you know, how much can we vet consultants? And um, but it is absolutely, I mean, that's probably the number one indicator of um, a successful capacity building project is is how the cons you know what skills the consultant brings, how um, receptive the grantee organization is to working with the consultant and that commitment and that relationship. If it if it breaks down the it, goes off the rails, hard to recover from. Um, and then in just in terms of resources, um, we actually have built down an internal, it's an internal SharePoint site where we have, you know, on almost every type of um, capacity building project that we, we fund, we have resources for that are appropriate for program staff. Um, since a lot of our audience is actually educating the program staff for the gatekeepers to the their portfolio of grantees to um, help work with that group to understand what they need. So. They oftentimes need resources and some training, um, but then we have a lot of resources. And actually, I brought one, which um, actually Barbara Kibbe used to run the capacity building um, grants program at, at Packard. She's at Monitor, she was at school, and now she's at the Monitor Institute. But she co-wrote this book, um, which is many years old now, but I find that this is, this is, it has chapters on how do you, if you're interested in um, finding a consultant to work on board development, what questions would you ask? Where would you go? What questions would you ask? How do you frame the engagement? What does a good work consultant work plan look like? So this is at the Foundation Center website, but what we've done is we've PDF the different chapters, and so oftentimes our program staff will, if, if they hear that a grantee approaches them and say, I think we need some help on evaluation systems design. Um, there's a chapter on, on hiring. How do you think about doing work in that area and hiring some expertise to to help move you through that process. Um, so we'll just send PDF chapters out. Um, so that's something that I'd, I'd recommend. How do you translate this, no pun intended, internationally? I mean, I, I, that's got to be it. It's a whole different ball game level. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I mean, do you have in, in country advisors? Do you have people who are here who work with them? How does that mm -hmm. Both. That's a great question. Um, so since what half of our grant making is international, yeah. we actually we have a few um, actually Mexico City, a Mexico City office and a DC office. But we um we actually flirted with the idea of opening an Africa office since much of our work is there. But um, that didn't happen um, with some tough decisions on resources in the last year and a half. So we still are primarily uh, headquartered here, but our staff is out. Um, you know, I sit next to the quality. In, um, education developing countries team, three of them, and they are never in the office. They, one is living in Africa now. and um, So they're out in the field. Um, but the big issue is uh, in some of these areas, there are very few kind of management service providers. There are very yeah. few consultants um, in general. And then you know, just the quality issue <laughs> emerges when you don't have a strong pipeline. And so that's a real issue that a lot of funders um, who fund capacity building are thinking about is, in addition to grants to our organizations, our grantee organizations, how do we help build an ecosystem of service providers that are critical? Um, and so we've actually invested some in, in the Mexico area, um, Mexico City area. Um, I know Packard's in, invested a fair amount in, in Africa and yeah. building some local capacity to help organizations. And you get into a, a tricky, tricky decisions oftentimes in terms of do you, you say you say a grantee organization puts out a request for proposals to um, help them with evaluation systems design, you know, and are they able to find someone in country yeah. in Kenya, or do they need someone who comes from DC or New York? You know, and there are going to be some some cost differentials and potentially some some cultural considerations as well. So, 
it's it's a really good point. It's a lot when we are so blessed here with mm -hmm. you're so so many talented people who are, are willing either a pro bono basis or um, as their job to help organizations out in the area. But not well, some countries are it's not part of their core dynamic of how they were founded. I mean, we were founded in a different way than everyone else. So mm -hmm. philanthropy doesn't translate literally in some countries. Exactly. No, you're right. Let me, let me shift in. Let me just share quickly a few of the lessons that we've learned. Um, you know, a few of them have come out already, but, um, and I'd love to hear potentially disagreement or, um, or yeah, that, that, that makes sense. We've experienced the same thing. Um, one, of, one of the major lessons has just been, it's been so critical to have in, um, a well-positioned internal, so internal to the nonprofit, it's doing the capacity building work, champion for the work. So, you know, ideally that's a, a board chair and an executive director, or at least in large organizations, potentially a COO or vice president of programs, but someone who has, um, a, a, you know, influence over resources or space, um, and who can really uh, st steward or, sh or shepherd along the process. And we found that if um, you know, one of the, the biggest barriers or bumps that, uh, along the way with some of our projects has been a change in staffing where in, we lose an executive director, we lose someone who has been that capacity building champion mm -hmm. halfway through the strategic planning process. And it is so hard to get things back on track at that point. So it's, it's one, it's without onset, making sure you have a well-positioned champion, plural if you can. Um, and then two, we're starting to think a lot about um, succession, like a transition plan, even with capacity building grants. So if this person is not mm -hmm. there, and, and you, you all know from your work with nonprofits that um, you know, the, the tenure of, of some leaders in nonprofits is not that great. And we've had a, even a subset of our grantees where it was, you know, it, it was a three-year capacity building grant, and by year, uh, it was like a year and a half in, 50% of the people had actually transitioned. And so we didn't plan for that. And so now we're, we're learning that lesson the hard way. Um, uh, is that? Mm. <laughs> when you think of one person leaving an organization, of, you know, right? small organization, and it feels paralyzing, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and um, it, there's another point, um, which I can dovetail off this one, is organizations that are in crisis, and for small organizations that lose VP staff part time, yeah. that can be certainly be the case. That is not the right time for self-reflective <laughs> capacity yeah. building and learning <laughs> <laughs> when they yeah. need a quick infusion yeah. of cash. Or if there's, you know, or for other organizations, maybe some of the big organizations, they just found out that they lost the, the major donor. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 a time for planning, but it's also a um, you've got to respond quickly. Um, you know, if there's an earthquake or a flood, you just need to confusion of cash. It's not time to be doing the sticky notes on the whiteboard. Yeah, I just experienced that <laughs> twice with the SB2 because we focus on such small organizations. One had 100% staff turnover and one had 100% board turnover in oh the year gosh. that I was wow. with them. So it was just a... So you were like the actual wow. one person. Wow. Yeah, you were yeah. the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> stable I mean, person. You were the glue. Yeah. Yeah. You were the glue. Yeah. You lose a lot of yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. even just going through with what we thought we were going to go through with the strategic plan or mm -hmm. whatever it was we were doing with them, when you lose 100% of your staff, the ED is just focused on keeping mm -hmm. everything going. Right. Or the board turns over, you don't know, you know, a lot of things change. So it's... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, what's the range of budget sizes that you have for your 60 grants yeah. now from small to large? Sure, six, seven, sure. Seven, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so we have made capacity building grants as small as $5,000. I mean, the size of the organization. Oh, I'm sorry, the size of the organization. Oh, it's, um, so so $5,000 to $60,000 grants. Right. But the organization, that can be all over the place. That can be from the you know, very small two-person community organizations right. all the way toward the multilateral uh, and aid agencies, you know, Million, hundreds of million dollars organization, the big, the big guys, um, and everything in between. Um, in terms of a sweet spot, I actually do think it's um, those organizations that are earlier in their career, mm -hmm. or their their stage of life, um, or scaling, or just coming out of. You know, they have gone through what you just described in terms of extreme turnover. They're they're starting to get their feet in, and now they need to plan. You know, they need to start building the foundations out. So there are a few sweet spots in there, but we, we actually do fund all over the place since our grantees are, are so different in, in size and life cycle. 
Well, could you talk a little bit about different approaches for the small guys, maybe versus the medium guys? Because I mean, we don't yeah. fund anything over four million okay. as an operational sure. budget. Typically, it's it's two or less. But then mm -hmm. we stay with them. We fund them for three years, and then we stay with them within the portfolio forever, mm -hmm. right? So we have a spectrum, right? Uh, so I'm just interested in how you approach sure. things of different sizes, and how you sure. think about them, and how you deal with them over the period. Sure. So sometimes we find with smaller organizations, um, some of them have never worked with consultants before. So there's some of the piece that I already talked about right. in terms of helping them be educated consumers of outside expertise that they might not have. So that's a piece of it. Um, another another piece of it is. Uh, Sometimes it's helpful depending on, and this isn't unique necessarily to small organizations, but um, oftentimes there will be this appetite to, to do something. We need to build an organization, but there won't be a lot of agreement or clarity about what the highest priority needs are. Uh, so, so what we find um, sometimes with smaller organizations is that um, to, to encourage them to go through a self-assessment, there are capacity building um, self-assessment tools that are free and that are out there um, that will oftentimes recommend if they're um, if, if the need is essentially to identify a capacity building plan as opposed to some of the larger organizations they have a, a big team they've worked with consultants they've already done their strategic planning and they're just at a different level of fine-tuning now the exact metrics that they are going to track and they need to design the data systems mm -hmm. where some of the smaller organizations are just you know it's still they need help everywhere. They, they don't have a communications plan or strategic plan or their board. You know, they're just putting together their designing their board committees, and they have no HR department at that point. And they're you know, coming up with policies. So, um, so it's really uh, it's it's more help in terms of the planning. You know, how do we sequence these this different support in the in the right way? And then <coughs> and you said it sounds like you all do this um, effectively. Is stay with them, too. For the for the big organizations, it's oftentimes a you know, you give them money, one shot deal. They already know who they want to hire. There, they run. There tends to be more technical assistance, some guidance in terms of, you know, whether we do the organizational assessment, sort of, uh, so providing some data back, you know, reflecting back to the organization's leadership what might be needed when, um, and then, you know, sh sharing that plan with the Hewlett Foundation staff, and then us committing to say, okay, you know, we we will we we can't promise we'll be giving money. You know, we give you the three years general operating support. You can spend that on anything you want, but on top of that, we could we'll can you know we'll we'll work with you on strategic planning, and then next year it sounds like you at least right now think you're going to be interested in communications planning, and we'll work with you through those steps. So it's it's a little more um, tailored, I would say. Good question. Um, so actually, this this is a a little bit. Um, dovetail on what I just said too is uh, some of the people on the capacity building sector think of capacity building a bit like a Mongolian barbecue is particularly with these type of organizations you go in and looking at all the different options and you need all of them and you pile it on your plate and you want to hire every consultant <laughs> to do it and for those of you who have been consultants or have been how, how many of you and Jean's probably been in this role have actually been in an organization and you've been the one to manage the consulting relationship so what we find is typically nonprofits, particularly the smaller ones, tend to underestimate how much time it takes mm -hmm. to manage a consultant. Because you're like, oh, or they're going to do yeah, everyone right. else. They're <laughs> doing the work. <laughs> That's why we're hiring them. It's Stop free labor. Right. <laughs> right. So we've all been through those. And you typically look back and say, oh, I wish I had planned for more time to have those meetings with the consultants to rewrite their survey or whatever it may be. But um, so because of all of this, kind of our eyes bigger than our stomach, um, we typically, in our grant making, would recommend um, kind of a sequenced approach to capacity building, having organizations focus on their highest priority needs first, and then making sure we can understand what they'd like to do next and help support them, but really focus the energy, you know, the, the limited energy, emotional and otherwise, on the highest priority capacity building needs, as opposed to doing, say, five things at the same time. That has typically been a mess in term, and also, um, kind of as a corollary, the having multiple consultants, so you think or working with just one consultant, <laughs> you know, working with three or four consultants in a small organization um, on different topics at once, you know, our grantees have come back to say, you know, our, our consultants are telling us different things. This is not clarifying. <laughs> yeah. This is confusing yeah. for us. And so that's also kind of a pink flag for us is when we, we look at what our grantees are saying yeah. that they, they need, and then we'll work with them to try to help help guide them in terms of some focus and then um, picking the consultants that would be appropriate.
Um, another piece that we've learned um, is that cost sharing. So, so we're a very well endowed foundation. Um, we we could pay the whole cost of the consulting service for our, our grantees, um, but often we think that it's best not to. You know, sometimes and we have no real rule of thumb, but sometimes we yeah. think they're paying eighty yeah. percent with the grantee organization investing something, so they have some skin in the game. And I just think that's that's mm -hmm. human nature in terms of if you're you have some skin in the game, you're going to 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 focus plan for it a little better, make sure the right staff is in place to, to make the project go and and be implemented. So, um, what are the factors that lead you to that decision versus one hundred percent level of commitment? Um, and oftentimes our program officers will have a sense of that. So so you all know certain leaders who it's it's just in their blood to. Focus on building the organization. These are the people who you, you know, there's something in your, your your gut that just says, I can give my money to them, and they're going to, they're the type of leader they're going to run an effective organization, and um, and then not, but not everyone is that is that way, um, and so sometimes it is helpful to, you know, if you're not quite sure that the money is going to be spent, well, have this conversation of, well, if we gave you eighty percent, you know, where would you find that other money and um, how would you deploy your team on this? How are you going to engage your board? And it's not, as I said, it's not, there's no real line in the sand on that one. It's just a general um, practice that we've started to, to engage in. And or, um, since we do have this core support, general operating support that we provide mm -hmm. many of our grantees, you know, they can tap into some of that, certainly. Um, and, and that, this leads me to another piece of it. Um, and we, we are, are a large foundation, so this is, um, understandably easier for us to do, but we found that a, a mix of um, funding types can actually be highly effective for capacity building. Uh, a question I always get, and I actually had the same question when I came to the Guild Foundation, was about three years ago now. Um, well, if we give so much general operating support, why would we bother doing all this extra grant making on capacity building? Yeah, it just seems seems logical. So if if they're really committed to, right. <laughs> to strategic planning, they will pay forty thousand dollars to hire. You know, so it, so it's come to help them do that. Well, the reality, and, and those of you who led organizations, um, it's it can feel a little bit like robbing Peter to pay Paul when you're when you're dealing with a constrained organization budget. Yes, you have general core support for some of that work, hopefully, um, but it's really pretty powerful for that champion internally. Let me just say to the executive director to say that they have from the Hewlett Foundation or some um, you know, earmarked money specific for strategic planning that they can only use for that. And it's protected. And it, you don't get into all of these different perspectives within an organization of, well, no, you're taking money away from program. And the pe we're going to serve 10 fewer people now because we're going to be doing this evaluation system design. And so that's some of the feedback that we got is, you know what, those $30,000 project support grants for specific organizational development needs can be transformative sometimes um, at, at their time, the right, at the right time um, based on need versus some of the, you know, the big core support. Those are, those are so important to the organization's flexibility and health too. Um, but that mix together can be quite powerful. How much of your decision on what is a grant to the organization is based on their readiness? Seems like they have to be ready. So mm -hmm. you base a lot of that on how much they're asking, how much detail they put into mm -hmm. putting that strategy together. Is it a yeah, um, mission fifty percent, fifty percent ready? Is it what did they notice? It's, it's a good question. Um, it's there are really no no firm rules on that or, or guidelines. Um, you know, we're most so all of our grantees have to go through a very oh, nice to meet you. Um, a, a very rigorous regular application process, and so they're clear at that point, or or else we wouldn't provide them the three hundred fifty thousand dollar check on what they're trying to accomplish and how would they get there, and do they have? You know, that's where you do all the financial due diligence. Um, so they've gone through that, and then it's um, typically your organizational management challenges, leadership challenges are ongoing and normal. So we will expect to see those emerge on a regular basis from all of our grantee organizations. And so it's really though, you know, how we think about getting other capacity building dollars is really those, um, we've gone through a number of exercises really relevant in this economic downturn. We, in, our, in our portfolio of grants, we are trying to see some five, 10 year change. And in our portfolio, we're gonna have organizations that are key to our strategies. 
because of what they do. They're just so aligned with what, what, we, what we're trying to accomplish in the world in terms of climate change or um, education systems improvement. But we have to make sure that they survive and they are thriving really five years from now, as opposed to one, one year. And so we've actually had to make some really hard decisions this year, both in terms of the parent grants, but also in terms of capacity building grants. We're now kind of rationing these, these dollars, and we've essentially had to make um, decisions that if, if it doesn't look like the organization is strong enough to survive, and they're not central to our strategies so that we need them around five years from now, we've had to let some of them go. So we've had a lot of hard um, we, we try to tie them off with some money so they're not going off the cliff, but we'll say, you know, in a year and a half, we can't support you with core support. And then those sometimes it's, it's, it's really, it really depends on the, the situation. Sometimes we'll provide capacity building support for those organizations um, that are exiting our, our portfolio, um, sometimes on fundraising or strategic planning to help them give, give them a bit of a runway to go out. On. But it's it's really the, the decision um, of where to, so I don't make the decisions in terms of where all the money goes. I approve of the money. If the proposal is thoughtful and if it's within the guidelines, then provide the money. It's really each program officer who manages their own portfolio and understands these questions of strategy, who, who's doing, doing the best work, and we need to keep make sure that they, they survive and they know um, in a lot of detail what other funders are doing and thinking and who the leader is at that point. And so it's a really of a dynamic um, set of decisions constantly. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is just on the, um, so I, I don't know if you, if you all find this, but um, no matter how how much trust there is between a, a funder and a grantee, um, it, there's still there's still this power dynamic um, mm -hmm. that, that we can't get away from. And so when grantees are going through the proposal process, for, particularly for our, our bigger, their regular grant, their parent grant, um, it's it's still a bit of a sell job all the way until we we'll call we call them up and say congratulations, the board has approved your grant, three year operating support grant, you know now and then there's this window that we've we've come to realize is that's actually the sweet spot of our program staff um, now saying all right we are partners for the next three years. Let's really talk honestly now about what you all need to build your organization so that we can reach our shared goal. And you become much more of a partner there because they know that they're, you know, what they, that dirty longer that they air you then is not going to affect their grant. But it is harder, much harder to have those conversations in the kind of the proposal process. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of why we've separated those two pieces of the, you know, the big parent grant and then this, this supplemental grant. Eleanor Clement Glass, who runs the donor engagement group here at the foundation, uses this analogy for that um, about dating. It shows us what grant making is like dating, <laughs> and like everyone should be allowed to go on a first date and put their best foot forward. Like the funder should be allowed to, the grantee should be allowed to. You know, if you went on a first date with someone and they said, "Okay, let me tell you about everything that's wrong with my mother, <laughs> or you know, right. my family, or my job, or whatever," like you wouldn't go on another date. So it's okay, and it's sort of that process of by the time you get married. <laughs> In this case, to your grantee, you know, are you having that conversation? And I always just thought the analogy sort of brings that into focus in a nice way because it can be, I, I've found, you know, so tricky when, like, I know we're really here to help. I know it's okay if you tell me right. the hard thing on the first date, but you don't know. <laughs> or I, And I might be wrong. I, I might think it was okay that you told me and it's not. So I think the analogy is. <laughs> yeah. How long for both of you are the. And not that I'm making a funding decision, but. Like how long is the dating process for both of you? <laughs> SV2 dates, how long does SV2 date? Six months? Six months. Six months. Yeah, oh, really? Short. It's a grant round. Two or three meetings, maybe? I mean, you talked to them on the phone and then they came in. The six, the six months, does that count? Not that, that he was dating, first, but. The, oh. Counting the time that we first start looking at all the organizations yeah. or the time that we contact them? And begin yeah. to have that Probably contact yeah. from. Yeah. 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 But they don't really open up to you until three to six months into your consulting sometimes. Yeah, how, what really do you, so if you're finding it's after in that the consulting engagement starts, it's three to six months sometimes after yeah, that? Yeah, some three months. It, it depends. I mean, so I mean, it depends which one you're talking about. You're talking about bossy. So, I mean, about a year and a half ago, we implemented the McKinsey tool, the organizational capacity oh, yeah, sure. assessment. That's been real helpful. Okay. Because So they've gotten the grant. Okay, we're now married. And then we do the, the OCAD. 
for I three years. Just for three years. Yeah, which flushes it all out. So do you do the um, the McKinsey tool after they get the grant or before they get the grant? After, after the grant, but before yeah, the grant. Right there you go. Okay. So right after with the board chair and the ED, you know, as a minimum, right? Right. And so then we do the debrief, and then we plan this, you know, the strategy. So the same thing. Sweet spots the first six months to twelve mm -hmm. months. So you know, we try to get as much done as we can in the first six months. I was actually referring to Reach, where I was oh, going yeah. out okay. a couple of the consulting meetings after it was like, okay, this is broken, and we don't know how to fix this. You know, and that finally came out. And one of them was That's fundraising. Good. It's just, it's just not. This model's not working. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's just so hard for people to open up. I mean, it's mm -hmm. kind of tied to one of the other questions I was going to ask because I mean, you mentioned strategic planning, you know, fundraising, Marcom, but I didn't hear executive coaching because people mm. don't like to ask for it or they that's, don't think they do it, mm -hmm. but they sure do. Right, or board, <laughs> board development work or, right. so yeah. Is a program manager then, program officer, then, like, get involved and, like, offer that? So, actually, <laughs> executive, yeah, so that is one of our big funding okay. areas, but I would agree that's a really tr tricky one <laughs> oh, yeah. to, to navigate. Yeah. Right. It comes from different sources. Um, and actually, sometimes that's where we find actually being a little more prescriptive about using an org assessment yeah. tool can be very helpful. Because uh -huh. then you get perspectives, it can be anonymous data rolled up into one, and it can be read back to the organization. Right. And then, you know, right. some. So, yes. Um, and oftentimes we'll pair executive. So sometimes executive coaching standalone, but typically paired when there's some sort of executive leadership transition. So we'll make sure that the you know icing's on the cake with some coaching afterwards, mm -hmm. um, and then certainly clarity um, on the you know with the on what type of leader is needed on the front end before the search process starts. Yeah. Just for how long do you guys date before you get married? <laughs> that was 12 years. This is going to be the best <laughs> podcast ever. <laughs> dating, dating efficiency with the Healer Foundation. I mean, ours, is so ours is so short. I'm just wondering how long does it take to you to get you to think? know your grantee before you make the three-year commitment? Because yeah. so, so many of our grants are renewal. Right. I would say half. Mm -hmm. Half yeah, and a half. half so, so we do in the three-year grant and we have another one. So oh, you've been doing it for 30 years. Uh -huh. But what about your new ones? Yeah. Yeah. The new ones take a lot longer. Uh -huh. And I would say, I can just, I'll speak to the philanthropy portfolio. Um, I would say nine months easily. Um, we, it also depends if there's an organization yet. Uh -huh. So sometimes it's just an idea. Uh -huh. And those will... <laughs> For instance, um, I don't know if you've heard of this the group called Philanthropedia. Okay, oh, and so that was an idea. Oh gosh, maybe 14 months ago, where you know some some talented Stanford students had an idea about that how they could do getting expert reviews on nonprofits. Um, you know, it's been really hard question. It's actually been a question of scale. It's it's very hard to make the the economics of, of such a service um, possible um, work. And so, you know, had met with Paul Bress, my boss, who's the president of the foundation, and um, a colleague of mine in the philanthropy program, just a bat around, well, how could we make this work? Um, we in, d gave them a small planning grant, it was a three-month planning grant, to see if they could, you know, actually get something, you know, come up with a white paper, and that, that we could get it out to some people in the field, and we could really work on the idea. And then they just took that on, did a, did a great job, and then... You know the next step, and this is this is pretty unique. But we were able to provide them a little bit of space within the Hewlett Foundation, and it's kind of been incubated there. So they have a, a grant, and it's all been you know paid for performance. If these are if these specific milestones are met, um, then you know. And I think right we're, actually we're looking at another grant to them that'll hopefully get them so they they ramp up and they're starting to get some publicity. So that's an example where you know it's real hands on. There's a lot of a lot of dating going on um, to get to then the big the marriage, if if, if you will, the you know some uh, maybe eventually um, three year general operating support grant, with the thought that with continued performance that would be renewed. Is that is that a trend um, in the pay for perform or pay, pay by milestone? I've noticed mm -hmm. that in the you know so, well obviously in the corporate world as well, but right. I just I'm curious in the big foundation world if that's gaining some traction. So we, we do something, uh, we've done it now for the past four years, called our, our worst grant contest, from which we, it's from oh, which we learn the most. God. <laughs> oh, no. There are skits and hats and belts. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. And no video cameras and no. Yeah, I think legal or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 
It's it's actually it's been really interesting how it's evolved. Is that that contest? Um, get, I answer your question because it's related to this year's contest. But that that's been um, a really important culture building um, experience for us as as grant makers. There there there's not a lot to help us. Um, you know, essentially force us to look back, learn about what's working, and do our work better. You know, we were pretty insulated as a um, as funders in terms of what the government imposes on us in terms of performance, and so we kind of have to build these systems on our own. Um, so four years ago, um, Paul uh, Bress had this idea of well, let's get, have all programs. I talked about the seven different program areas we have. All nominate. You know, they don't nominate their best grant because that's easy to talk about, and then their their worst grant from which we learn the most. And in that first year, um, what and this is right when I was coming on board, all the grants that were nominated by programs were because the executive director of our grantee left. Mm -hmm. no. Or the, <laughs> <laughs> oh, got, you know, another major funder pulled out of the, the funding relationship. All, no, no, nothing that we actually had any responsibility yeah. for could control. Right. And so we've been trying to evolve this contest over the next few, so, you know, two, two and three years ago toward um, a strategic failure. So something that was actually not at all an organizational development issue on the behalf of the grantee. You know, they were all, they're performing great. It was actually a design decision on our part or something that we had influenced over that was just turned out to be a bad call in retrospect. Um, and so, and we've also shifted from having to pair it with the best grant. We've slowly become more comfortable just talking about failure um, and what we can learn from it. And so last year's um, worst grant contest happened to be we give a lot of grants to academic centers and researchers. I know that's different from the type of grant making we do, but um, what we found was there was very, the incentives um, with academic researchers and to get the information, which is usually why we funded them, the research, but we, we don't want the research to sit on shelves. We wanted to actually influence policy. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> But we, we, we really couldn't get this paper performance thing. So we've actually started shifting and holding some of our grant dollars to make sure that certain milestones happen. And it actually came out of some discussions with um, grants that haven't gone very well, particularly with academic researchers. But it could be extended. We now think of it as a, how can we use some of the system, the, the um, opportunities we have for reporting with our grantees and the timing. If we have a three-year grant commitment, there are ways to provide the money at different points. At the same time, we also are funding these organizations because we think that they're doing great work and we don't want to be too heavy-handed. So it's a Fine, fine balance. Mm -hmm. But we have started to talk about it this past year. And then June, who won the grant, the worst grant award this year? Your program. <laughs> <laughs> um, In my first grant at the foundation. Oh. <laughs> it was a capacity building grant. It was capacity building one too. Where we, it was actually, a, it's a different model of capacity building, but um, I don't know if you all are at any point thinking about it, but it was a, a peer learning community, which we had fun. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 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 Thinking about it. Right now, but we're about to fund a cohort of an out of school kind of work. Oh, okay. That's great. Well, at any point, I'd be happy to share <laughs> <laughs> some lessons that we have learned. Um, you know, everything from staff transition. That was the example where we had 50%. You know, it was a three year learning community. And within the first year and a half, 50% of the people who were the ones actually participating in the learning community were on to different jobs. Yeah. Great. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, there, there are a lot of, in terms of, of different, you know, who you have in the community, um, teams versus individuals. I've put it on the list here. Yeah. <laughs> was, was this a, in an area that tends to have high turnover within the individual organizations it, on top of it, or? You know, I actually, that's a really good question. I, it's, um, it was actually um, some community-based organizations, um, which I think will, will tend, perhaps have higher turnover mm -hmm. for, for certain reasons. Yeah, 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 exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, so my inclination is yes um, to that question. Well, we have um, it's it's a I won't take a lot of time to talk about it here because we only have a few more minutes with you. But it is a it's a collaborative not only of the organizations that get funded, but also of three funders doing the funding. So it's like collaboration upon collaboration. <laughs> that sounds like ours. And, yeah. and, and the other two funders are the Sandhill Foundation and the Packard Foundation. Okay, and so sure. we're very fortunate, particularly um, as regards having learnings about past uh, cohorts of, mm -hmm. of having Packard involved right. because they've done it 
So they were a number of times. This one as well. Oh, good. And so they all can share some. But so months. one great example is we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago about um, Sand Hill is working on hiring the facilitator of the cohort, and mm -hmm. Packard said, you know, we were talking to different people on staff who've done cohorts before, and one recommendation that they had for us was that we narrow to two that we would be, you know, equally comfortable hiring. And we let the cohort choose their facilitator, which mm -hmm. is a little bit like to your point earlier about choosing your consultant. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, you know, that's something we as SV2, A, probably would never have thought of if we were doing it on our own. And B, we might not have taken the risk of saying, no, no, we have to like them. You know, it's not, <laughs> we, can't, we can't hand that decision over. And so I think right. we are able, hopefully, to leverage a lot of learnings. Um, and I'm sure we'll make mistakes, but I hope it doesn't. I hope it doesn't win the, the worst grant. Yeah. <laughs> and actually, that was so. Um, the the Spur Learning Community, this cohort um, model, we're only a year and a half in, and so it was actually great because now we're able to recover from some mm -hmm. of these things that we learned the hard way. Yeah. And we were actually um, Packard was really helpful because they have a lot of experience in this. But we almost went in this Spur Learning Community model almost, I think, to the other end of the the spectrum in terms of having the, the peer learning group develop everything. And, and and what I mean by everything is, you know, which which consultant, what what the logic model of the work was going to be, essentially what are the goals and the outcomes and um, what the indicators of progress are. And, um, you know, it essentially took a year to get just the, the planning meeting started. And so at that point, it's, there's just a, a momentum issue that we were, we had a bit of trouble with, with the transition. So there's probably some nice balance that's in between that. You still get the ownership, you get the right people, but you're, you're making some progress because if, if pe people get frustrated if they don't see that things are happening in some and, realistic and, amount of time. And, and consortium, you know, when you have different people who, this is their, their side stuff that they're doing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, getting people to commit is a huge, huge shift. The, the organization I'm chair of, most of our work is done with this big consortium called the Vision Council that put together. Mm -hmm. Children's agenda, and, and and it has people from government and people from nonprofits, and they all sit at the table. And you know, there are people who will de de derail the whole process just if their particular thing doesn't come out as the very top priority of everything. And you have to really manage the process carefully. Absolutely. Why don't we have a either either or a final question or a closing thought, and then hopefully there's a few minutes if people have lingering thoughts for Jen, but we'll let you all get back to your to the get back to your work days. <laughs> Just one quick question, Jen. So yeah. how are you sharing your learnings with the whole eight hundred and ninety portfolio? Do you only go through the program manager or can you put out kind of yeah. examples of, you know, best you know, success stories and yeah. offerings? That's a really great question. Um, it's actually something I don't think we do very well. Um, but that's where we could get a lot of, of leverage. Um, one, um, one thing that we are just starting to do, you know, I think instead of biting off everything, all the types of capacity building work that we do, um, we're actually starting this year to, and we've never done this before, if we can get examples of good strategic plans and that we can, if we get the permission to share those with program officers and in other programs, and then with other grantees, it's just something simple that we we are planning to do this year that we haven't done before. That just could be could be a model. Um, so so that's one example. We've actually, and this is a little bit different. Um, it, um, we won't have time to talk to about evaluation, but it is something that we we've we've struggled with. Is is we essentially have to continue to make a value proposition for this work. You know, mm -hmm. Millions of dollars and. What do we what do we have to show for it? Um, and so we've actually we're experimenting with a new application this year that actually has um, a very light version of a um, capacity self assessment with the to try to get a baseline. You know, again, we're walking that fine line between is that in the, the sweet spot when people are going to be you know what are they going to say what well, they think we want to hear, but then um, ask the same set of questions at the end of the engagement um, you know, year uh, out and then follow up. Um, some years down the road to see what's, what's sticking or not. Um, but we also this year, um, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Center for Effective Philanthropy, there's a grantee perception report. Um, it's something we've done since 2003, and, and June was really helpful this year on ours. We did both a staff perception report and a grantee perception report at the same time, and we're able to um, add some custom questions to the grantee. So this is getting to the 800 
asking them some specific questions about how we can do our grant making better, what would help them build their organizations. Um, and then we added a few capacity building related questions to that in terms of what they most needed, particularly in this, this strange, um, difficult economic time. And then um, for those, we were able to look at the cut the data by those who had gotten the capacity building grants from us, did they look any different than the other you know, 740 that didn't? And actually, statistically significantly different on a whole bunch of dimensions in terms of you know, their perceptions of the foundation's impact in our fields of funding, you know, our relationships with our grantees, the, the list goes on and on. Um, and then we, we did, for the first time, gather some baseline data in terms of how the, whatever grant they got, and again, it's all different. It's comparing apples, oranges, and tomatoes in terms of type of capacity building grant. But how do they feel that that, um, I believe that's impacting their um, ability to achieve their mission? Is it, does it matter at all? Or is it having significant impact? And so we have a number now that's hard to put in context. We don't have any comparative data from other foundations on the same question. Um, but we're hoping to then have that be a baseline that we can track over time to see if these grants, if we're really getting any better at doing capacity building grants as perceived by our grantees in terms of is this capacity building work helping them be more effective at achieving their the intended impact. So that leaves me with maybe a fast final question then, which is, does that make you think about the dollars that you allocate toward capacity building? If there's a statistically significant difference with the organizations that get it, is there a strategic conversation about more or not really? <laughs> I think Maybe this year we're going to have one. one. <laughs> we actually, um, just with the foundation, we were down um, a lot in our grant making. You know, our asset size shrunk a lot. Um, and we're, we're moving back in the other direction, thankfully. Although I'm not sure about yesterday. Um, <laughs> That and was weird. that was that was weird. It essentially, meant um, program all the programs took a, a really big hit, and we did the same thing. Even though we had a lot of people saying, actually, maybe we should increase the capacity building dollars in this time because these are so valuable. But we also wanted to, you know, <laughs> take our. It, that's exactly right. So, um, thank thank you all. This has been great to hear your um, your thoughts, your excellent questions. Really appreciate it. And um, this is kudos for the work that you're doing in terms of your you know, financial commitment as well as your your time involvement. It was really inspirational. So thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. Yeah.